There we go. Good evening and welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. It is good to be back with our HCC family. Um, Pastor Mark got sick at his stomach today and to err on the side of caution in case it is a stomach bug, he stayed home. Uh, I think uh, it's just an accumulation of too much adrenaline and too much traveling and too many time zones <laughs> and too much exhaustion. But I do appreciate him being cautious with our HCC family and your health, too. So he stayed home tonight, but fortunately, I had already planned on teaching tonight. So no, 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 you're stuck with me anyway. Um, <laughs> so tonight, um, we are going to be talking about Elijah. Elijah, not Elisha. Um, and before you roll your eyes and think of this guy again, um, we're going to talk about his character, the who he is, not so much the what he did. So hopefully it's a, a little bit of a different perspective on Elijah. Um, so we will pray and we will uh, get started. A uh, couple of prayer requests. Um, we've had a pretty busy prayer chain this week. Um, Dana's mom is back is in ICU. She's going to be there for a couple more days. Um, uh, the holder, Sarah and Tim and them, they still have COVID in their household, and they need prayer. And just on and on. Um, but on a happy note, today is Riker's first birthday, and the little boy that nobody thought... <laughs> would live past being born, turned one. And I'm telling you, that chunk of monk is a strong little guy. He may not be able to move his legs, but those arms are strong. Um, so miracles are possible. Riker is a one-year-old living testimony to that. Um, uh, so let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll, we'll talk about Elijah. Father God, I thank you for this day and this opportunity to be in your house and to be with my brothers and sisters in Christ and, and to study your man, Elijah, and Father God and his character and the who he was and not necessarily the what he did, even though they kind of go hand in hand. And Father, I ask that our hearts hear your word and we glean from it and are able to apply it to our lives today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So his name's Elijah. Can anybody tell me what the name Elijah means? It means Yahweh is God. Um, he was a Tishbite from Gil Gilead. He was um, a Benjamite. And the tribe of Benjamin produced several heroes and mighty warriors. Elijah lived during the 9th century B.C. The northern kingdom of Israel had already split off from Judah for a long time, and it had become apostate. Do you know what that means? Does anybody know what apostate means? Everybody know? Does it, it means they backslid. They backslid. Fancy word for they, were, they fell in it. Mud. Head toe. Bad stuff. Uh, they had started worshiping idols. They primarily worshiped the idol Baal, uh, partially because of the influence of Jezebel, who was the queen at the time. And um, a man whose name means Yahweh is God or the Lord is my God would have stood out from the crowd and faced danger of persecution or death because... He was named after the one true God, and everybody else was worshiping the other guy. There's no information about events surrounding his birth, and no real information about his training is mentioned, um, but we can tell from his habits that he was an outdoor kind of guy. He had a strange dress and appearance. He was fleet of foot, which means he ran fast. And he had a rugged constitution that resisted famine. He lived in caves. And this suited him for a full-time role as a prophet and servant of the Lord, 
because he was able to move from place to place easily. And uh, since he was able, since he was able to do a full-time prophet servant of God job, God used other means to take care of his needs. Um, Elijah was one of the most important and one of the most respected prophets in Israel's history. And God used him to bring up about a revival in the northern kingdom. God accomplished a number of miracles through Elijah, and he was one of the most significant figures in Israel's history, along with Abraham, Moses, and David. He was going to come to earth again before the Messiah, and he appeared along with Moses at the Transfiguration. And listed as one of his special traits, he was a hairy man. <laughs> he had super speed. He ran 17 miles from Carmel to Jezreel faster than Ahab's chariot. And you can find that in 1 Kings 18, 46. So let's look at one of his characteristics. He was a prophet. So God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Similar to many of the prophets of the Bible, Elijah didn't seek out to be one of God's messengers. and God, Instead, God chose him directly for that position. And when he was called, Elijah didn't hes hesitate to take on the mission, even though it appeared his life would be threatened by a very wicked king. Elijah set out at once for the capital city of Samaria to deliver the announcement to King Ahab. Elijah's message and the meaning of his name go together like a fresh glass of milk and warm cookies. He walked, talked, and encouraged others to believe that truly the Lord was God, just as his name stated. As a prophet, he adamantly shared God's message and warnings. Often, both came under fire. Sometimes, however, people turned from following the false gods and found themselves deep in worship of the one true God. Elijah came near to all the people and said, and you can find this in 1 Kings 18.21, it says, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt thee between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. They didn't say a word. So have you, but this is where I need you to interact with me, have you been challenged by God to share the gospel in a situation or in a specific way that was well out of your comfort zone, was bold, or brought you under fire? Have you accepted the challenge to pick a side? Kim, did you raise your hand? Oh. <laughs> ah. Don't even scratch because I'll call on you. Just kidding. Uh, has anybody gotten called out of their comfort zone by God to do something to, to, um, to share the gospel in a specific situation? Chrissy? Wonderful. See, got to minister to somebody in McDonald's, a young mother with three boys. And if she had three boys, she needed ministry too. <laughs> Marilee? So Mary Lee had the opportunity, for those online who couldn't hear her, um, 
Mary Lee had the opportunity to minister to someone who was under the influence, and he thanked her and and it broke into tears. Um, and she's expecting to see God do a miracle through him and in his life. Anybody else? Okay. So on the flip side of that, the people were silent. They were pre- presented with a challenge to pick a side. So think about it. Have you picked a side? And you're thinking, well, I'm sitting in church, aren't I? Well, yeah, you are. Are you following God in all the ways you know how? Which we all know that we walk out our own salvation with fear and trembling. So we all know it's a process and we're all at different places in our walk. So this is not about judgment. This is about checking on your own heart. Okay? Because I had... He presented it to me. I've already had to do this, so I'm passing it on. So, you know. Um, (laughs) Are you following God in all the ways you know how? Or are you trying to figure out how close to the world you can be and still be saved? Are you playing with that fine line? Or are you running towards the Father? I wasn't even looking up, Tim. You don't have to talk to your neighbor. (laughs) But we we know those people who, and and it's not just baby Christians who don't know the difference. It's not just baby Christians who are, sometimes we get very complacent as believers and we get tired of standing out from the world and sometimes we just want to do the comfortable and easy thing and that's to fit in and God did not You're right. Sometimes the fight is exhaustion. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And sometimes that's not about complacency. Sometimes that's about crawling up into daddy's arms and resting and recuperating. That's not necessarily what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is where you get complacent. Now, that's a good example, but it's not necessarily what I'm referring to because that's not a place of complacency. That is battle weary you still have the fight in you but you don't have the strength to do it anymore that's battle weary um complacent is you just don't care you just got to the place where you just it doesn't matter anymore you're it's a whole different attitude and you've just you've just been saturated with so much of the world you've been bombarded with so much of the world that What's it going to hurt if I do this? What What's it going to hurt if I, if I do that? If, if I, who's going to know? What's it going to matter? When you have that attitude, then that's probably when you need to check your heart. <laughs> or repent, <laughs> yeah. Because that, you may be getting real close to that fine line. You might be playing jump rope with that line. <laughs> Because God calls us to look like him, act like him, and live like him, not the world. We're called to stand out. And as a prophet, Elijah certainly stood out. And he called, when he was called, he responded immediately. And you may be thinking, I haven't been called to be a prophet. That's okay. But have you heard from God? Number two is Elijah was a man who heard from God. See, time after time in Scripture, we see folks leaning their ear towards the Almighty, and Elijah's on that list. He heard from God. 
peppered throughout all of 1 Kings chapter 17 through 22 and 2 Kings 1 and 2, we see instances where Elijah was leaning his ear. 1 Kings 17, 2 says, uh, Then Yahweh's word came to him. Well, it wouldn't have come to him if he wasn't what? Listening for it. He was anticipating it. He said, go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Go tell Ahab, thus saith the Lord. This, this is the one that gets me. Go tell Ahab, thus saith the Lord, in the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even mine. Yeah, that's great. Little little ray of darkness there. Um, but Elijah lived consciously in God's presence, and he relied upon his strength. 1 Kings 17.1, he refers to his God was the living God, the covenant God, the Lord God of Israel, and he referred to him as the God whom I serve. He was sold out and fully committed to hear God's voice and do God's will. And that took practice. He didn't just wake up one day and be good at it. It took practice. And don't think he was perfect at it because he was a man just like you and I. He suffered depression and he dealt with all the Debbie Downer days like you and I do because, you know, he didn't pout by the river, river Cherith for no reason. So I didn't have to feed him with, use the ravens to feed him because he was having a great day. He did it because, like you and I, Elijah was just a man. But have you made it a practice to hear God? Has God ever asked you to deliver a difficult word or a word that you knew that was going to be unwelcome? I see Irma back there nodding her head. You don't have to tell anybody what it was because if it was unwelcome to the person that spoke it, you don't need to air their dirty laundry. <laughs> yeah. I have had to deliver unwelcome words and it's not my favorite thing to do and I've had to witness unwelcome words being delivered. Um when Mark and I were fairly new to Pentecost, I we were at Mountain Meadows Church of God, and I was sitting next to Alma Kelly. And if y'all have been around us at all, you know that Alma Kelly smelled like heaven. You might have thought that was Ben Gay she was rubbing on her achy muscles, but no, that was the anointing oil of the angels. Um. She had a special relationship with the Lord, and you wanted to make sure that if she called you out during church, that you had your heart right, because the Holy Spirit had just ratted you out, and she was going to read your mail. So I sat next to her, so if she needed to tell me anything, I didn't make a spectacle of myself coming across the, the front of the, the sanctuary. But another young lady who... Um, Alma, in her own flesh, had no way of knowing anything, was across the sanctuary, and Alma said, and I looked at her son, who was sitting on the other side of her, and he went, oh, no. So he gets up, and he takes her little four-poster walker and folds it up and sets it over there, and Alma begins to pray over this girl. And she starts delivering an unwelcome word. To the point to where this girl has her Tammy Faye Baker makeup print in the carpet between Alma's little orthopedic shoes because she's got her trapped until she's done telling her what God has laid on her heart. Her little diabetic shoes, the little rubber parts had mashed into the side of her face and she wasn't letting her go until she was done with what God said to tell her. That's obedience. Um, even that's a boldness and it was not delivered out of hostility or malice it was delivered out of love and concern for her soul and there was a change in her life 
but she needed apparently that kind of wake up call now if you were on the other side of the room you couldn't tell if you were behind me you couldn't tell what Alma was saying to this young lady the only reason I knew was because I was sitting right next to Alma she was a fragile lady and she required assistance and I was going to help Mama Kelly any way I could not when she was under the anointing <laughs> she didn't need any help anybody she was praying over they were the ones that needed the help but she was bold and she did it out of love she did it out of the right heart she did it out of the right spirit but she did it she was faithful she heard from God and number three just like Alma Elijah was a man who walked in obedience Many times, God directed Elijah to speak hard truths, trust for provision when circumstances appeared bleak, or stand firm in faith of God's promises being fulfilled. Time and time again, Elijah set the example of loyal obedience to God our Father. So, according to 1 Kings 17.5, he went and did according to Yahweh's words, for he went and lived by the brook Cherith, that is before the Jordan. So, in 1 Kings 17.10, he arose and went to Zarephath. God doesn't always require such extreme hard truths to be spoken. But he does expect obedience. So can he trust you to be obedient when he calls? And have you been obedient when he calls? Was it easy? Was it an easy situation, a difficult situation? Or is it getting easier as you practice hearing his voice? It is it's easier to obey than to disobey. It's one of the first lessons I taught my kids. It's better to obey. It, obedience is better than sacrifice, isn't it, Micah Paul? Yes, he's got a thumb up, thumbs up back there. Because if you're obedient, you don't have to sacrifice anything. If you're disobedient, you're going to have to give something up. In my kid's case, it was either a toy or time or a pound of flesh, depending on what your options were. And with God, you don't want to give up what he might require of you for disobedience. I'm a pleaser. I always hated breaking my daddy's heart. That was worse than a spanking. It really was. Not that I didn't, like, repeatedly break his heart. But, you know, the disappointment on his face was worse than the belt. Um, and the idea that I broke Father God's heart, ugh, that makes me sick at my stomach. It just, so I've learned to chew on my tongue to make sure that my words are not words that hurt, they're words that heal. And when they come out before I have a chance to clamp my teeth down on them, I've learned to apologize quickly. <laughs> and when they come out and my ears go, huh? I make sure I go back and say, okay, this is what I meant. I'm not entirely sure if that's how it came out. <laughs> um, because I don't want to be hurtful. when it's not required of me. But there have been times when God has required hard truth. But that can still be delivered in love. And in order to deliver it in love, you have to be obedient. And Elijah was a man who walked in obedience. And according to scripture, he walked, he responded quickly in obedience. I still struggle with the respond quickly 
in obedience. And there's some things I'm Johnny on the spot. Shoot, yeah, let's do that. And there's some things I'm like, are you sure? Because, you know, that's not going to be comfortable. But I don't care if I'm comfortable. Not one bit. Not one bit. Number four, Elijah was a man who experienced God's provision. This one was pretty cool. Elijah was a man who drank in God's promises and found his needs quenched by God's hand. He had ravens feed him. He had a handful of flour and a few drops of oil multiplied for miraculous sustenance. He ran with energy far beyond human capability. And God's provision played powerfully and beautifully in his life. These instances and others can easily remind us of Father's love and healing and wisdom and provision as well. In 1 Kings 17, 4, he said, You shall drink from the brook. I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. And in verse 8, the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. So how many times and in how many ways has God provided for you? From gas money and groceries to health and protection, God has been faithful. And if you sit back and you think, I mean, if it's just even a good neighbor that he moved in, a new neighbor that turned into a best friend or Absolutely. Jenny said that there's probably a million ways that we could name, but probably twice as many that we couldn't name because we don't know how God provided for us by having us go a different way to keep us out of a car wreck that we're not aware of or, you know, any number of things like that. And, and you're right. I mean... He's a good God, isn't he? Amen. Is it something? <laughs> yes, she is. Your Barb is an angel, Kenny. We don't want to think about that. You're right. And he put you down the street from a crazy preacher who loves you to death, too, didn't he? <laughs> to think about, like Jimmy pointed out, just the things that we know God has done for us. It's astounding. It's overwhelming. The healing... I, uh, I had um, miscarried, and my back was out. The three vertebrae were twisted and up, and it was painful. I couldn't move, and I was heartbroken, and I was laying on the couch at home. And Carla came over, and she had brought us a prayer shawl. And Mark, it was for me, Mark already had one. And as our my spiritual covering, he prayed over it first. And my blood, my, my heart was 
broken, but besides that, uh, after having a miscarriage, um, it was acting weird. And uh, so the doctor had sent me home from the emergency room after that and just told me to rest because it was all connected and I would be okay in a couple of days. You don't say that to a lady who's just lost a baby, but whatever. He was doing the best he could, I guess. Anyway, so Mark prayed over that prayer shawl, and he came down, and he laid it diagonally across me, like this way. And then he prayed over it. And as soon as he said amen, my heart went back into rhythm. My spine adjusted itself. Nobody touched me but God. And I felt my body realign. And I began to heal from the miscarriage. And that's just one instance. God's protection. The big guy back there in the box, when I was seven months pregnant, seven and a half months pregnant with him, I flipped my car down a 20-foot bank. The seatbelt did not tighten up and the airbags did not deploy. I would have lost him if either of those two things had happened. They had to cut me out of the car. I did not get cut by one single piece of glass. The EMTs got cut worse (laughs) than I did. They got cut. I didn't have a scratch. I had glass in my eyelashes and my hair in my ears. They got cut getting me out, and I didn't even get cut washing the glass off of me. God's protection is overwhelming. The things that God, I know of, that God's done for me, eternally grateful. Breaking Becca's fever when I was on my way to the ER and Mark prayed over her and her fever broke. There was no need to take her to the ER. I mean, countless times, countless times, God's intervened on my behalf and the behalf of my children. His provision. I've experienced God's provision. It's not always monetary. Sometimes it's peace that passes understanding. Sometimes it's just in the middle of a storm, you hear that soft whisper. I'm well aware of everything you're worried about, and it's not yours to carry. Isn't that right, Irma? God says, it's not yours to carry, it's mine. (laughs) Lay it down. And Elijah, number five, was a prayer warrior. Many times throughout the Old Testament, we see Elijah in communion with God. He sets an example for us in our own walk of faith. He stands as a voice encouraging all of us to to grab prayer and be a warrior, to know the Lord is God and follow him. He was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. And then he prayed, and it rained again. He prayed, and fire fell from heaven. He prayed and encountered God. Prayer warriors change things, and prayer warriors change lives. And if it were not For prayer warriors, I dare say that most of us would not be here today. As pastors, we depend on our prayer warriors because there is power in prayer. There is victory in prayer. Spiritual battles are won or lost depending on the amount and quality of prayer prayed over the situation. Are you willing to be a prayer warrior? Are you equipped to go to battle and change things and people and situations? Have you? Do you have a war room or a prayer closet? I know Miss Mary Lee does. She's got a room set up. 
She goes in there, and heaven fills the house when she's in there. I know Kurt and Linda have a time set apart every morning like clockwork. They do. They have their prayer time together. They go to battle together. Irma, she can be found fighting any time of the day or night. <laughs> She's faithful to fight. Crystal's a prayer warrior. <laughs> Kenny says his wife locks him in the closet and he prays to get out. <laughs> oh, my stars, Kenny. You're not supposed to tell all your secrets. Goodness. <laughs> I can see she let you out. Oh, well, as mouthy as you are, I'm surprised she let you out this long. <laughs> but prayer changes things. And I know that sitting here tonight, there are men and women who would be dead otherwise. You had praying mamas or praying grandmothers or you had your little church mamas that prayed you out of hell and out of situations that probably would have sent you to hell until you had enough sense. And you've got friends now and you have your HCC family now that you call on when you need anything. Anything. Today, Rocker celebrates his one-year birthday. How many people went to war for Rocker? Well, a little boy that was born, and they told him, told Mom and Dad, we'll have to do surgery in the morning because he was born without an anus. We're going to have to cut one in. He's got all the pipes, but just no, no external drive. So we'll have to cut one in in the morning. So they go in the next morning to prep him for surgery. God took care of that during the night, and he had a poopy diaper. How many people went to war for him that night? So they, And God made it happen. And since then, every surgery he's had, he's gone to war for Riker. How much more? And that's just a little guy that you guys just appreciate. It's just a little guy who's a miracle. But how much more when it's more personal, when it's one of your own kids or it's one of your own family members? You go to war when you're passionate about something. You go to war on your knees. You go to war on your face. You make time and you seek God. If that means missing a meal, sometimes you just miss a meal because they're that important to you. Elijah was a prayer warrior. And Elijah, number six, expected miracles. We see miracles throughout Elijah's ministry. He stood as a man who trusted God, one who appreciated God fulfilling his promises. And in the process, we saw miracles. What did we see in Elijah's ministry? A bull offering doused in water, enough to overflow and fill the surrounding trench. Proved no match for the fire of God. I'd consider that a miracle at the hands of God Almighty. Then the fire fell and consumed not only the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. That's a big one. What about raising the widow's son from the dead? That might not seem like a big miracle to you unless you're the widow of a dead kid. In all, Elijah performed 16 miracles in his time. And it's kind of interesting that you know, when he passed his mantle, his spiritual, which represented spiritual blessing, on to Elisha, Elisha asked for what? Double portion. Elijah performed 16 miracles. Elisha performed 32. It's a three-day blessing. 
some of the uh, miracles that Elijah performed were um, he prayed for the drought, and it dried up. The meal and the, the flour and the oil multiplied. The little boy came back to life. The sacrifice was consumed by fire. Uh, the captains and the men were slain by fire. The rain came back, and the water of the Jordan was divided. How many of you think that Elijah would have expected miracles if he had not heard from God, been obedient to God, been prayerful. You see where he's going? All this is building on this relationship. And then the last one I want to touch on tonight, number seven, was Elijah was brave. When it comes to the hard choices in life, many people like to put them off. But one of God's greatest spokesmen can help us make the most important choice of all. In the ancient world, every tribe had a special class of religious leaders. They were called by different names, shamans, witch doctors, priests, but they performed the same function. Priests were go-betweens, bridging the human and spirit worlds. They conducted the various ceremonies and rituals that gave people access to their deities. Priests were called upon to read and interpret signs and omens. They made sacrifices and presented offerings to the gods. They were asked to help protect against evil spirits or to heal the sick. But these priestly types generally weren't deeply concerned with morality. They usually didn't deal with the issue of right and wrong with good or bad behavior priests dealt with spiritual power. It was different in ancient Israel. The God of Israel, the true and living God of whom we study in the Bible, was not just powerful. He was also good. Because God is a person whose very nature is moral. He cares a very great deal about morality in us. To the biblical God, doing good is more important than conducting rituals. Right living is more important than correct religious ceremonies. How people treat one another is more important than how they carry out sacrifices or recite forms of words. In fact, the only kind of worship the true God accepts is one that includes a personal commitment on the part of the worshiper to living a life of humility, truthfulness, mercy, and justice. In order to teach this truth to people, God called some individuals to be a new and different kind of religious leader. These special servants were called prophets. Unlike priests, the biblical prophets were not so concerned about ritual or animal sacrifices. They didn't really care about what people did when they came into the temple as much as they cared about how people lived outside the temple. Prophets told people clearly what was right and what was wrong. Let me say that again. They told people clearly what was right and what was wrong. They pointed to sin plainly. They called for repentance, for turning away from sin, asking forgiveness of God, and living in a new and better way. And they warned about what would happen to those who refused to listen to God. Prophets were men who spoke for God, and not just many centuries ago, they still speak to us today. The message Elijah championed rang clear and seemingly easy, but not everyone wanted to hear its contents. Jezebel stood at the front of that line. She sought out and put prophets of God to death. Her husband, King Ahab, allowed it and just kept worshiping Baal. And the unwelcome message, however, did not deter Elijah. He bravely championed God Almighty and the messages given from above, even when those messages offered challenges, correction, or bad news for the one receiving them. And this kind of made me laugh, this scripture. Um, It's in uh, 1 Kings. 
and Obadiah, which was also a, a prophet, but he was the more passive aggressive guy. He's working in the system to change the system from inside and Eli's is the the bold, hairy guy on the outside who's trying loud and proud guy. And Obadiah it, it says I'm gonna start with verse seven. It says, And as Obadiah was in the way, behold Elijah met him, and he knew him and he fell on his face and said, Art thou that my Lord Elijah? And he answered him, I am. Go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And he, Obadiah, said, What have I sinned that thou wouldst deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? <laughs> what are you trying to get me killed? That's what he said. As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom whether my Lord hath not sent to seek thee. And when they said he is not there, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. He's looking for you everywhere, and he's made them swear that you're not there when they said you weren't. And now thou sayest, Go tell the Lord, behold, Elijah's here, and it shall come to pass as soon as I'm gone from me that the Spirit of the Lord will carry thee wherever I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab and he can't find thee, he will kill me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. Was it not told to you what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? How I hid a hundred of hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water? He's trying to save his own tush right there. It's like, why are you asking me to go kill myself? You are setting me up for death. Ahab is going to kill me because I know that as soon as I tell him that you're here, God's going to translate you somewhere else, and he's going to come back, and you're not going to be here, and he's going to kill me for telling him the, the, the false, and he was all upset. And that just made me giggle because I can hear my, my kids say, uh-uh, I'm not delivering that message. No way. Mm -mm. And I've had that conversation with God before. He's one, but I've had that conversation with God before. I don't want to tell them that. Mm -mm. You find somebody, uh -mm. I don't want to do that. But Elijah was brave. He knew that these people were hunting him down to kill him. They wanted him dead. They had killed as many prophets that, as they could get their hands on. And he's just walking up in there like, mm-hmm, here I am. You, you go tell him I'm here. Announce it. Blow your little trumpet. Tell him I'm here. Bring it. It's basically what he's saying. He's standing out the gate saying, yo, here I am. Bring it. And he's like, mm-mm, not delivering that message. No, thank you. And he was brave. What do you think made him so brave? Besides brain cells that never connected. What? Total trust. Because God had provided for him. He'd heard from God. He expected miracles because he was a prayer warrior. He walked in obedience. He knew he couldn't lose. He knew he couldn't lose. God had already told him what was going to happen. He hadn't told Obadiah, so that bit was kind of funny, but Elijah was loud and proud. He was brave, but he was so much more than just loud and proud. There was a reason he had the, the bravery and the boldness to be loud and proud. He had the relationship to back it up. He had the calling, the anointing of God to back it up. Before he was called, he wasn't anything extraordinary we don't have a pedigree for him there's no long line of loud and proud recorded he's just 
the guy that was chosen, the guy that God said, hey, you, and he said, yeah, what's up? Let's do this. Sure, I'll be your huckleberry. That was for you, Jenny. But he did it. He trusted God explicitly because he heard from God. He walked in obedience. He experienced the provision. He was a prayer warrior. He expected the miracles. And he was brave. And that's where we're going to stop tonight. Any comments, questions, observations? Miss Irma? Yeah, Yeah. just like with King David when he, before he was king, he was just a boy and Goliath was taunting him and he said, I killed a bear and I killed a lion. What makes you think you're any better than them? I'll take you down too. He'd seen God's provision. He'd spent time with God and he was obedient. You're right. Just like King David. And Goliath learned the hard way. Don't let the kid play with your sword. You'll lose your head. Anybody else? Well, thank you guys for coming out tonight. And um, Pastor Mark will be back with us on Sunday. I'm sure it's just a... I'm sure it's just nothing. Uh, I'm sure he'll be fine. But I do appreciate him being cautious. So, and not overdoing it. Father God, thank you for this day and this opportunity. Father, to, to study your word and to study this prophet. To, to learn more about him and his character and your relationship with him and what drove him to trust you, to follow you so quickly and easily and boldly. Father, let us learn to apply some of those characteristics to our own lives so that we can be more like you, so we can hear you and follow you and be obedient. Even if we're not called to be as loud and proud as Elijah was, let us learn to hear your voice and be quick to obey and not as argumentative when we're asked to do something. Bring us back together Sunday to worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name.